powerful. Absolutely powerful. Why should he love me so? I could sing it in Romanian. Ce mult you beat. Why should he? But I love that song. I used to sing it when I was a kid, and then I never heard it again. And I googled it, I, and I could not find it. And tonight I took notes how to find it in English on YouTube. Praise the Lord. What a privilege to be together. What a privilege to open the world. What a privilege to know that when we get together, the Holy Spirit is here. Let's bow our heads for another word of prayer besides that prayer. And then we start. Father in heaven, we thank you again for Jesus and his sacrifice that surpasses any type of understanding. We thank you for our infinite love. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your kingdom. And tonight, Father, we pray in humility that you open the world and touch the hearts. We need you. We need transformation. Only you can do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start with... Uh, a few questions, and not only questions, but a few stories. And first, be, right before we start, what is the purpose for your life? What, why are you alive? In my Bible, in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, I know the plans that I have for you. And it's not the plan, it's plural, the plans. It doesn't refer to the general plan of salvation, though it could, but it refers to the daily plans. And the Spirit of Prophecy says, Jesus made no plans for himself, ministry of healing. I do have the quotation, so you don't have time for it. I would make them available for you if you want to. <clears throat> Jesus made no plans for himself, but every morning he received the plans from the Father for that day. Period. And then, next sentence in the same paragraph. So should we. She beautifully says, every morning go to God in prayer. Present your plans before the Lord, ready to fulfill them or to surrender them, give them up according to his will, and then receive his plans. Isn't it strange that we, instead of seeking God's plan, we seek God's blessing for our plan? And the more we present our problems, the more problems we seem to have. And we fail to understand that it's a greater blessing to give than to receive, that it's a greater blessing to bless than to be blessed. And this is what I learned, at least in my own experience, that when I struggle and I pray for my problems, I don't seem to get any relief. But if I surrender, sacrifice myself, forget myself, forget my problems, and I pray for others, for some reason, the more I pray for others and give up myself, the more God solves my problems. Yes. And I don't have to struggle with my problems. In fact, so beautifully, I have so many stories, he goes ahead of me that I don't have to go there. By the time I am ready, okay, let's see what this, how can we fix this? I get a phone call, it was solved. I don't have to deal with it. It would be sad to call yourself a Christian and yet not be curious to know God's plan for you. And God says, I know the plans I have for you. God's plans are more important than your plans. He says, every morning, seek God's plan in a different quotation. I have them all, and I could put them on the screen. In a different quotation, we have no wisdom to plan for ourselves. Literally. That's what she says. We have no wisdom to plan for ourselves. In the other quotation, the reason for our failure for our lack of success is that we trust too much our plans, our methods, our wisdom, and too little God. He loves you and me that he gave Jesus. 
What is easier, to give you a job or this, or to give his son on the cross? If he gave Jesus, the Bible says, how will he not also in Jesus give us? But the, what we fail to see is the word in. In Jesus give us all things. God doesn't UPS blessings. They come with Jesus as a package. They don't separate. We want the blessings without Jesus. When Jesus comes, blessings come. They come together. Now, we should not seek blessings. We should seek Jesus, obviously. But anyway, and so God has a plan. Very interesting. Jesus was ready to give up eternity, to give up heaven, to risk everything to save one soul. And the Bible is very plain, very clear, very clear. You think you love Jesus? Yes, no? Yes? We sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Anybody can sing the song. Satan can, Satan can sing the song and he has a better voice than you or me. It doesn't mean that if we sing the song, we love Jesus. How do you know if you love Jesus? Well, I think I am honest. Yes, I believe you are honest. But how do you know if you know? Because you may really don't know how you are. Heart is so deceiving. How do you know if you really love Jesus? Well, the Bible gives you the spiritual thermometer to measure your love for God. It says in 1 John in chapter 4, if you say that you love God and you don't love your neighbor, you are a liar. And the love of God is not in you. Is it in the Bible or not? Yeah. And so my good friend, Elder Ted, just spoke before me on your love for the neighbor. And the Bible is very clear. Love God with all your mind, all your heart. All your, you remember? And love your neighbor just as you love yourself. That, that means if you pray 10 minutes for you, you must pray 10 minutes for the neighbor. My wife, we have two granddaughters. If I put the pictures on the screen, I'm going to forget the sermon and talk only about them. <laughs> and one is six, one is three months old. And they are absolutely precious. If I knew how they are, I would have had first the grandchildren and then the children. <laughs> but anyway, absolutely precious. And my wife spoils them a little too much. And I don't need to say much because I didn't tell you a drop of what she does, but she really spoils them. I mean, and I say, honey, stop buying so much stuff for them. You bought so much and they grow so fast that they don't have time to wear everything that you got. So many things are still new and, and, sh and our granddaughter, it's already too big to use them. Just buy what she needs. And when she grows, you buy more. No, she's so sweet. I got to get, look to this dress. Oh, okay. So my wife and I had several kind talks. Please, please, please don't do that. Okay. Next day she comes home with two pairs of sandals, number six. Why would you get two? One is not enough. And both number six, at least if you got number six and number seven. So six months later, she still had, she says, honey, I was listening to your sermon. That's the reason I got two. What do you mean? You said that you love our neighbor. Our neighbor has a daughter six years old, and they are very poor. So when I got a pair of sandals for Eva, our granddaughter, I got a pair of sandals from the neighbor because we got to love our neighbor just as we love ourselves. Oh, I said, bless your heart. Please do that again. Let me give you another example. We were in Kentucky many years ago, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> we were in Kentucky mountain. We literally lived on the mountain. We had a 50 acres property, literally top of the mountain, 360 view. And, and uh, some parts were pretty steep. And at the bottom of the property, it was a little flat. And we put a garden there. It was big. It was one acre garden, gigantic. Sorry. And anyway, nothing grew because it was so much rock. We were literally growing rocks. Nothing grew. So I tried to dig the rocks. Man, I could have built a whole palace with those rocks. Too many to, to dig up, so, and they are not small. They are gigantic. So what I decided, instead of digging forever until Jesus comes, I'm going to bring trucks with dirt over the rocks because you need about 8 to 12 inches of dirt to have a good garden. So I put there about 10 trucks. Great. Let's plant again. Vegetables started to grow, and the bugs ate it all. First year, nothing because of the rocks. Second year, nothing because of the bugs. And I tried again, and I tried again. And after three years, I said, you know what? I give up. And my wife says, do you remember what you preach about the neighbor? You prayed that God would bless your garden. Why don't you pray that God would help you give vegetables to the neighbors? I said, deal. I went in the garden. I kneeled down, and I said, Lord, if you bless my garden, 
I commit 50% of all the produce. Literally, whatever you give me, 50 or more, I will divide it half with the church and the neighbors. That year, my garden exploded. I mean it, I had pictures that people would come to see it. And people would look and say, 10 feet tomatoes with 50, 60 tomatoes per plant, three pounds each tomato. You think I am exaggerating? I have pictures, I can prove it. Tomatoes on the scale, neighbors, witnesses. This is like Canaan, gigantic. I have pictures with lettuce. I have pictures. What did you do? I'm praying. And then I took tomatoes, I went to every neighbor. Take a bag of tomatoes, some peppers and cucumbers, and I want to pray for you. Next, I want to pray for you. Next. Eventually they said, you are the pastor of the neighborhood. <laughs> you should not live for yourself. Jesus didn't come to be served, Jesus came to serve. And he called you not to be served. Everybody wants to be served. Jesus didn't call us to a comfortable life. He called us to care deeply to the point that people see Jesus in us. Let me give you another example. We moved to Kentucky, and I said, Lord, I'm not going to pray that you give us a house. I'm going to pray that you give us a sanctuary where people can pray. Youth can come and have weekends with pathfinders that they pray. The church members can come and pray and vision. The elders come and pray. And to do that, I cannot do it in a, a, a place where it's house next to house. There is no room for parking. You cannot have a kumbaya song. You know, they are going to call the police, you know. So I said, give me privacy and space. Well, if you want that, you need money. It's not cheap. And so we saw a house, but it was ridiculously expensive, way more than I proposed in my heart. I mean, I wanted to pay 200000 and that was 380. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And, well, that's not Arizona, that's Kentucky, so... You think it's cheap. It's not cheap for Kentucky, but anyway. And so, I look to next house, and I look to next house. I said, Lord, give us a house where we can have a sanctuary that could be a blessing for the neighborhood. And I don't want a house for me. Sure, I'm going to live in it. I want a house where people can meet you. A house that will be a hotel, a house where the sick come, a house where the people in pain that need comfort come, a house that... People are going to come there and pray. And we looked house after house, 52 homes for 10 months. We could not find anything. And I just gave up. And my wife says, don't you forget what you preach. Answer to prayer is not an event, it's a process. It takes time. I said, honey, stop preaching to me. I know the sermon. <laughs> and after 10 months, I gave up. Oh, I'm going to buy any house and that's it. And she said, don't you do that because you ruin God's plan. God has a plan. Not only in big things, but in small things. Nothing, 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 nothing happens by chance. But all, all, all things work together for a reason. And we so many times forget that. And my wife says, don't you do that. Honey, I'm tired. We need a house. So I talk to the realtor. Okay, half an acre, house next to house, we buy it. Is it 200,000? It is 200,000. Okay. And my wife says, let's pray. We kneel down and we say, Lord... If we do a mistake, we give you our consent. We give you permission to stop it, to ruin our plans and do your plan. Don't let us do a mistake. We want to be a blessing for the neighbors. We want to show Jesus in the neighborhood. We want to give them a chance to know God, to know the good news, to have a chance to be saved, to have a chance to, to know the good news that Jesus died for them, to have hope. Give us that type of house. Don't let us do a mistake. But if you don't care, then we are going to buy this house. But I give you permission to stop it. I call the realtor. We are going to come and sign the papers, make an offer. Okay? Don't come. I pick you up 9, 9 a.m. Okay. 15 minutes later, he calls. Right when I got in the car, my father fainted. I cannot come at 9 a.m. I have to take him to hospital. Okay? 11 a.m. He calls. I went to hospital. He was feeling good. He had nothing. I came home. I'm going to come in half an hour, pick you up to sign the papers. Okay? 11.15, right when I got in the car, my father fainted again. I cannot come. Okay. Two o'clock, I am coming. My father is okay. I told him not to get off the bed. I am coming. We signed the papers. Two o'clock. Fifteen minutes later, you know what? We don't need to go. You got a house. I said, what do you mean? 
You remember 10 months ago, that big house, 50 acres property, top of the mountain, nine bedrooms, six bathroom, cabin in the woods for privacy. You remember you told me about prayer, cabin in the woods for prayer for people. You remember that space that was 380? Yes. They dropped it to 200. Okay. That's the beginning of the story. We go, we sign the papers, eventually get the house. Finally, Thursday night, we move in the house. No furniture, we just go there, sleep on the floor, pray and say, Lord, we dedicate this house. We pray over this house. We are going to anoint it and dedicate it to you. There is nothing wrong to actually dedicate a house to the Lord. We are going to dedicate, this is your house. We want you to use it. Fr Thursday night. Friday morning, we clean a little around, plan, my wife, you know, how do we paint, what do we paint, move, do this, move this wall. Oh, come on, honey, don't give me work. She always does it. And so Saturday morning, I get in the car, get down the mountain, long driveway down of the property, next to my mailbox, a truck and a man leaning on the truck and stops me. What are you doing here? You are trespassing. No, we bought a house. We hate you. We want you to move. I said, that's welcome. You don't even know me. We don't want anybody here except a pastor. I said, I'm a pastor. Are you? Yes. We don't want any pastor. We want a pastor who believes in prayer. I love prayer. Oh, I'm going to call all the neighbors and tell that God answered our prayer. I said, what do you mean? Well, the rose pastor so-and-so, he told me the name. For 16 years, he prayed for everybody. When my wife died of cancer, he prayed. When the neighbor's son died in accident, uh, car or whatever accident, he prayed for us. He would visit us and pray for us. And he got retired, moved to Florida to his kids. And then a young family came, they bought a house, and they were in parties, alcohol. We prayed, and they were foreclosed, they lost the house. Another family came, we prayed, they were not approved. Another family, for 10 months we have been praying that God would not let anybody in this house before a pastor comes. You are our pastor. Nothing happens by chance, but all things. How many times we go to God and we have plans and we never seek God's plan? Let me give you an example. I already gave you a few. I was in a district long ago, 29 years ago, in my very, 29, 30, whatever, in my very first district. And, and I used to be somebody, education, business, influence, power, uh, I had a, my wife and I had quite a few businesses, and one of them we owned a sewing factory, making clothing. And we sold it in Romania, we sold it in Germany, we sold it in all over Europe, and we had quite a good salary. Uh, average salary in that time in Romania was 1,600 to 2,000 a month. We made an average of 50,000 a day, every day. I remember I would come with 70,000 at home in a good day. Would, the worst day, I had 25,000 in one day. When I came home, my wife says, what's wrong with you? Only 25,000 today? <laughs> and so we had money. I knew the prime minister of the country. I knew the chief of police, the mayor of the city. We ate together. I, I was somebody. I gave money to the church, the church construction, evangelism. And so they called me to ministry. And the president said, Pastor uh, pa Pavel, we cannot give you 50,000 a month. We'll give you 2,000 a month like every pastor. Can you live with that? I said, yeah, I guess I can do that. And then I said to myself, I'm somebody. I gave money to the church. They are going to give me the best, biggest possible, nicest church in the conference. Nah. Huh. They sent me in the worst church in the mountains, remote place, where I would need translation from Romanian to Romanian because I didn't understand the Romanian, you know. It, it was a dialect. When they would talk, I was like, whoa, is this Romanian or a different language, you know? And my wife and I wanted to take the car and go and visit our district. And I was complaining, why would they send me there? Is it punishment? I did nothing wrong. They just hired me. My wife says, honey, wherever God sends you, God has a plan. You need to listen. I said, leave me alone. You are not the pastor. You don't understand. <laughs> I said, I'm going to take the car. We had a very nice, expensive car. And then the people, don't take the car there. Don't you take the car. I took the car. We got suspended on two rocks. I, I, I had, they had to call a tractor to get my car off the rocks. I said, I'll never take the car there. Next time, we took the train. We get in the train. And a few stations later, they told us, you need to get off the train. The train doesn't go there. We get off the train, and they show us, you see that train? That goes there. It was like in movies, Western old movies, a train that had wood benches and smoke. Ooh, you remember? 
And we got in that train, and we went up the mountain, and we got to that location, there, there was no blacktop. And it was raining for about three days. And I had a Giorgio Armani suit, Ralph Lauren shoes, polo tie, mud and rain. And my wife gets off the train in the mud. And I'm looking, what should I do? I'm going to get my shoes dirty. What should... And the train starts moving slow. <laughs> you know? My wife says, honey, get off the train. And I put a foot down. And then when I put the second one, I go deep in the mud. And when I leave the first one, my shoe stays in the mud. And the mud gets into the shoe. And I kind of lost my temper. I said a few words. And my wife says, now you calm down because you are a pastor now. <laughs> and so I said, what am I doing here? And I go, and they don't speak clear Romanian, and I, good people, godly people, loving people, I learned to love those people. But in the beginning, there was something wrong with me. What am I doing here? Because I'm somebody. And I go there, and I tell them, you got to work. You got to serve. You got to save the lost. You have a mission. God put you here for a reason. And they look to me like I'm speaking Japanese, and they say, you don't know our life, pastor. You cannot tell us what to do. Until one of them, his combine broke, and they could not harvest the corn, and the rain was coming. And I took the whole church. Let's harvest the corn. We cannot allow the brother to lose his corn. Everybody take a row. We are going to work two days, harvest the corn. And he says, now you can tell us what to do when you work with us. <laughs> anyway, about three months, I did training. And in that training, I told them, God has a plan for you. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be trained. You can be old. You can be young. You can be healthy. You can be sick. You can be rich. You can be poor, educated or less educated. doesn't matter who you are. God has a plan for each one of you. Samuel, he was only six years old. You remember? God has a plan for you. And I said, we are here on this earth for a purpose. You don't have a job to have a salary. You have a job to tell your co-workers about Jesus. You don't have a school to get an education. You have a school to save the students around you. You don't have a house to, to have a cover. You have a house to reach the neighbors. Wherever God put you, you are responsible for those people. You are the watchman. If they die, their blood is going to be required from your hand. You are supposed to love them the way you love yourself. You are supposed to show them kindness, compassion, care. I told them, we need to reach this community. This village in the mountains, we need to reach it all, and the next, and the next. And they looked to me like, what are you talking about? Well, after three months of preaching about service, give discovery, finally they said, okay, pastor, let's invite the whole village, see who comes. And I divided them in jobs. You do this, you do that, you do that, you do that. Okay. Well, brother, there were two in the church. They are good people, but they were born not very healthy. Basically, they had a room, but there was no furniture inside. The elevator didn't go all the way up. You understand what I mean? And those people would grab you by hand and look to you, open the mouth, and not let you go. Pastor, we love you. I, I, I love you too. Uh, Pastor, we love you. I love you too. Let me go. Uh -uh. We want to stay here with you. And uh, people kind of avoided them. And, and they come to me. You preached? I did. You said that everybody should serve? I did. You said that God has a plan for everybody? I did. You gave a job to everybody, but not to us? Oopsie. You said you do evangelism in three months, and you said that everybody should serve? I did. Give us something to do. Oh, Lord, what am I going to do? They are going to embarrass the church. If I have them greeters at the door, nobody would come after they cash them by hand, you know. What should I do? How can I get rid of them? Wow. I got an idea. I said, you pray. This way, they don't do mistakes, you know. You pray. Oh, okay. Now let me go. Oh, okay, pastor, we pray. They went home. Their father told me that for two, three, four hours, we pray, we pray, we pray. And then suddenly they say, who should we pray for? And the father said, well, evangelism is for the community. You pray for the community. Yeah, but they don't know. So guess what they did? They went to the whole town in the community, door by door. They knocked in the first house. The pastor said, we should pray for you, but we don't know what to pray for. What do you want us to pray for? The guy said, well, I have a cow. He's sick. Uh, I, that's my single source of income. I am poor. Would you pray for my cow? Lord, heal the cow. Bye. That's the shortest prayer ever. <laughs> Lord, heal the cow. Bye. Next door. 
My wife left me. Lord, bring her back. Bye. A month later, they come to me and say, Pastor, we prayed. I didn't know what they meant. Later, the father told me, what should we do next now? Give us another job. I said, whoa, it was peace in the church for a month. I said, no, you go back and pray more. Leave me alone. Just go back, pray more. Okay. Guess what they did? They went back to the first house. The pastor said they should pray for you again. And the guy said, well, my cow actually got well after you prayed. Okay, Lord, thank you for healing the cow. Bye. You follow me? A month later, they came back. Pastor, we prayed again. They actually prayed for the whole town twice, from door to door, from morning to night. That's commitment. That's commitment. That's care. And so, they come to me after two months. Pastor, what do you do next? I said, just leave me alone. Go and pray without ceasing. Okay. Guess what they did? Went back to the first house. The pastor said that we should pray without ceasing. Let us pray for you again. We had evangelism three months later. The whole church brought two people. This guy brought 46. 44 got baptized. I asked them, did they teach you Bible studies, what we believe, doctrines? Nope. Why would you want to be baptized? Because you care. Not our pastors, not our family, not our friends come and pray for us. You guys, you really care. We need that type of church where Jesus' love is real. If God can use those two guys, if God can use two demoniacs, if you remember in the Bible, if God could use a donkey, if you remember in the Bible, then God can use anybody. Am I right? We have no excuse when we are selfish or lazy. I'm sorry. Comfortable. I don't have time to go. I am too busy. You get time when you want to do something. Jesus is coming. From all that we struggle with and stress over, we don't take anything to heaven. He's going to be consumed, burned up. All we take to heaven is the precious souls that we talk about Jesus. You don't have to force them. You don't have to convince them. You don't have to manipulate them. You just tell them the good news that Jesus loves them. And then let the Holy Spirit do the rest. But you need to care for them. You need to pray for them. You need to help them. You need to feed them. You need to do what Jesus did. And that's the best possible evangelism. And that doesn't cost anything except involvement, care, self-sacrifice. Another example. Every morning, she says, every morning, Make yourself available to God for that day, for service. I put it in my words, but I do have the quotations. So every morning I pray this prayer. Here I am, Lord. So many times I'm so busy with my to-do list, with so many things in the day, that I am so focused on my things, that I am blind to people in pain around me, deaf to people. Please, Lord, help me forget myself, sacrifice myself, and open my eyes to see people. Make me a blessing. The Bible says that we are the light of... Make me light. The Bible says we are salt. Make me salt. Make me a blessing. Spirit of Prophet says that nobody, quote, nobody prays right seeking a blessing for self. So, Lord, make me a blessing for others. To the degree that you bless others, to that degree God can bless you so you have what to bless from. So, Lord, make me a blessing. So, I'm praying that prayer. And then... <clears throat> I'm driving to a board meeting. It was a Thursday night. And as I'm driving, I pray, Lord, if there is anybody that needs a blessing today, please use me. And as soon as I pray, my wife calls and says, honey, Gucci is sick. Gucci is our dog. King Charles Spaniel, sweet. He sleeps on my pillow around my head, literally. And she says, Gucci is sick. He's vomiting blood. Whoa! I call my elder. I cannot come to the board meeting. You need the board. I have to go back. I have an emergency. I go home. I pick up Gucci, run to the vet. They found that he, playing from on the front yard, he swallowed something that got stuck in, you know. So they worked a little, got it out, and, and the vet says, Mr. Goya, you are in a suit and a tie. I've never seen you in a suit. Thursday night, why? Are you? I have a meeting. Meeting Thursday night, what type of meeting at the church? Wow, you are part of a church. Yeah, I'm the pastor. Oh, you never told us that you are a pastor. Should I? Say, I'm a pastor. You never asked. 
Oh, you are a pastor. We, as you came, we, we are discussing what happened to people and to animals when they die. Do they go to heaven or to hell? I said, okay, let me explain. I gave them a Bible study on the state of the dead. Oh, we never heard that before. Come tomorrow to check on the dog. Tomorrow I go back. He says, we talked about what you said. When you talked about resurrection, tell us how resurrection is. I gave them a Bible study on resurrection. They said, we like it. Can you come back? For 10 weeks, I went twice a week and gave them a Bible study on a subject. My dog got well right away. But I believe that nothing happens by chance. I believe that God allowed it because those precious people had to hear. They didn't understand. They needed to know those precious things from the Bible. You follow me? When we focus on God, I was, I was in Cuba, went to Cuba many, many, many times. And uh, a lady brought to evangelism every night, 150, 200 kids, every night. I said, what do you tell them that they come like an army of kids? You fill the whole church and outside. And she says, it's not what you tell, it's what you do that has power. I said, okay, tell me what you do. Well, I cannot tell you, the story is too long, come and see. Okay, where should I come? Tomorrow, two o'clock. Okay, I take the pastor, tomorrow, two o'clock, I go to visit the lady. When I go to visit the lady, her house was literally smaller than my wife's walk-in closet. I mean, it was from here to here, from there to there. L like my shed where I keep my tools, you know, literally small. And in her house, it was two bank beds, this with two levels, this with three levels. Here the children will sleep, here the parents, and here the grandparents. And between the two beds, you would walk like this. It was extremely crowded. In the front of the beds, a, a chair with three legs. I, I've never seen that. A short chair with three legs. And on that chair, a, a camping stove so small. And that was all her furniture. Broken poor. And it was almost two o'clock. I says, I got to go out. It's two o'clock. Okay, let's go out. As soon as she goes out of her little house, an army of kids, over 250 kids come. I says, sit down. They all sat down on dirt. I said, whoa, how did they come to your house? And she says, these neighbors don't have a job. I am so blessed. I have a job. I make $14 a month. 14, one, four, 14. $14 a month. She said, I am blessed. They don't have food. I cannot give them all the things in the world, but I can give them rice. I can afford to buy rice for the whole community, for the whole neighborhood. And it is a blessing. And she, have you ever watched Muppets? In Muppets, in cartoons, they have a, a mouth that goes from ear to ear. When they tuck, the whole head opens. She opened like a Muppet's mouth and she said, I am blessed. She says, I have the blessing to, feel the, to feed the whole neighborhood. These kids, when they hug me, I feel like blessed. And I said to myself, I have three refrigerators and three freezers packed and I don't feel blessed. And she feels blessed. And she says, this is the greatest blessing. When I feed them and I see them happy and they hug me, I feel like I'm already in heaven. I am blessed. And the lady says to the kids, give me the paper. I said, what paper? She says, well, I want to, to, to tell the good news also, not to the kids, but to the parents. But the parents will never listen to me, but they listen to the kids. So what I do, when the kids come, sometimes kids talk, they don't listen. And I teach them every night a Bible story, and I want them to listen. So I tell them, this is the way that they listen, and I also reach their parents. I tell them, to make sure that you listen, and you don't start playing games, you need to remember the story to tell it to your parents, and they need to sign a paper that you did remember the story. And if you don't have the paper signed from the parents, tomorrow you don't eat rice. So they go home and they tell the story to the parents, they get the paper and they come back. This way I eat the kids and the parents. Beautiful. I said, what can I do for you? She says, nothing, I am happy, I have a salary. I said, lady, I don't have a lot of cash with me, but I have a $50 bill. Take it, use it. She looked at the money in the sun. I've never seen so much money in my life. I cannot touch it. Take it back. <laughs> what a blessing to care for people. And we are so stressed because we care for self. When I take, when I used to take my former churches into mission trips, 
people that we would go to were blessed. But our people, when they came back, they were more blessed than the people they blessed. I don't know if you know what I mean. The real happiness is to fulfill the plan that God had for you. We take nothing to heaven. It is very strange. God called Israel not to salvation. God called Israel to mission. Because if he called them to salvation, that means that God loves only Israel. But God loves everybody. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants all to be saved. And he called Israel to mission, and sure also to salvation. But he called them, he says in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, to be a kingdom of priests. He says there, all of them, not only Aaron, all of them. Uh, the Spirit of Prophecy says, to show God's love to a fallen world. They are called to be, she says, a force of attraction to the world that doesn't know God. They are called to be a light. They are called to be a blessing. They are called to be a force of attraction. They are called to give the good news. To, there is a God who loves you, who, who is going to die for you, and that's your chance to be forgiven, to be saved, to be in heaven, to give the good news. What did they do? They had a mission. They had a work to do, to reach the world. They, house was not supposed to be only for them. You cannot come in my sanctuary, you are unclean. Their house was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. Abraham, God told him, I'm going to bless you, and it doesn't end there, so that you may be a blessing for all nations. You follow me? They are supposed to reach the world, but they closed themselves between four walls, and therefore they lost their call. And in the New Testament, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, we are a kingdom of priests. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are the salt. You are supposed to reach, go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of, to give the good news. That's your job. And we are so focused to self. Satan wants us to be so self-centered to the point that we ignore our neighbor. And the Bible says, to the degree that you love your neighbor, to that degree, you actually love God. And if you don't love your neighbor, you are not a Christian. You may go to church, you may do whatever, all the forms, you are not a Christian. Unless God's love lives in you, unless people see Jesus in you, when people see your kindness to say, man, this is different. In a selfless, in a, in a selfish, self-centered society, this person is selfless. This, I can see Jesus' character in them. Unless we, are, we represent Jesus, we are no Christians. We misrepresent God's character before the world. And so, God called you to show love and compassion. And so, going back, God called Israel to be a light, to be a blessing. Well, let me give you an example. <clears throat> I was 17. I was the choir director. And I prepared what I thought the best Christmas program in the history of the universe. I thought so. And I worked four months, choir, uh, solo, uh, poetry, uh, this, uh, drama. We worked four months hard, and we prepared the be best Christmas program in the humankind history, you know. And we presented the program, and then I went to my father, really proud. Dad, did you like the Christmas program? And he was very cool and not impressed, and he says, who, who, who prepared the program? We did. Okay, and who listened to the program? We did. And my father says, son, if you have a cow, and the cow makes milk, and then the cow drinks the milk. Why do you have a cow? I said, what do you mean? Son, if you make the programs, and you listen to the programs, why do you make the programs? You are not supposed to make the programs for yourself. You are supposed to invite the neighbors. If you, the church, prepare the programs, and you listen to your own programs, and you applaud yourself, why do you have a church? And then he says to me, you don't do agriculture in the barn, you do agriculture in the field and bring the harvest in the barn. You don't do church in the church. You are supposed to do church in the world. Jesus didn't say go to church. He said, go in the world, start from church, go, go, go. So many times we are so focused on our inside programs that we forget to be a blessing for outside people. And then we lose our mission. We lose our reason to exist. God 
called you for a purpose. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. By the way, I forgot that I am supposed to move the slides, you know. <laughs> Uh, who cares? Because I didn't plan to have slides. Every soul whom Christ has rescued is called to work. How many? Every, soul. Every, everyone. In saving the lost. This work has been elected by Israel. Is it not elected today by those who profess to be Christ's followers? Whoa. Every follower of Jesus has a work to do as a missionary. In the family, in the neighborhood, in the town or city where he lives. All who are consecrated to God are channels of light. God makes them instruments of righteousness to communicate to others the light of the truth. Isn't that powerful? The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of man. It was organized for service. The mission is to carry the gospel. By the way, if the church doesn't serve, it should be closed. That's the reason, the purpose to exist. If we don't fulfill our purpose, we don't need to exist. We, are, we don't have a church to go and have a program. It's not a club. It's not an entertainment place. The church is organized to serve and to save. From the beginning, it was God's plan that through his church shall be reflected to the world his character, his love, his grace, his sufficiency. The members of the church that he called from darkness are to show forth his glory. Isn't that powerful? I could go on and on and on and on and on. I have a bunch of quotations. I don't want to go on and on. But I want to continue a little with... A few examples. God calls people to service. Let me explain a little what that means. Every time you wake up, every time you go out, every time you have an activity, every time you go to school, to work, wherever, shopping, you should never act, do, without seeking God's plan for you. Because we don't pray that prayer, we don't have that experience. But if we would pray it, you would see what happens. When you stop being so much concerned about your needs and start praying that you are a blessing. For instance, I'm in California preaching, and they work me. Basically, I preach Friday night, Saturday morning, 9.30, Saturday mornings, 11.30, Saturday afternoon, 2 o'clock, Saturday afternoon, 4 o'clock, and then 6 o'clock. And then I had a meeting with the elders at 7. Questions, answers. I, I was squeezed like a lever. I was tired. I, uh, no, I lost, almost lost my voice. When I lose my voice, nobody is happy except my wife. And so I almost lost my voice. I was tired. And I said, I need to get to the plane. Because after a whole Sabbath of preaching, that night, Saturday night at 11.30, I had my plane to fly back from California to the East Coast. I was tired. I had to run from the church to the airport returned the car, I finished the church at 9, and my plane would leave at 11.30. So I had only two hours and a half to get to the airport, return the car, be at the gate one hour early. I got in the airport, and I said, I'm dead, and I'm going to fly six hours to Atlanta, plus you lose three hours because of the time change. That's nine hours from 11 to do the mathematics. From 11 plus nine hours. <clears throat> now listen carefully. Stay, you get there in the morning, stay one hour in Atlanta, fly one hour and 50 minutes to Baltimore, and then drive one hour home. Basically, I'll be home around noon next day. Red eye flight, you know. <clears throat> and I said a prayer like every good Adventist would say. Lord, I need to sleep. Please don't let anybody sit next to me. <laughs> And as soon as I prayed that prayer, God spoke in my mind and said, didn't you say that we should sacrifice self? But Lord, I really need to rest. And God said in my mind, who gives you this tremendous health? You are healthy. This energy, who gives you this? Isn't it a blessing from me? Do you know what it means to lose your health? I said, Lord, yes, I owe you my health and everything. Jesus was willing to lose his life to save a soul. Aren't you willing to lose a night? Well, I said, if you put it that way, <laughs> yes. So I changed my prayer, and I said, Lord, I'm not asking that I rest, but I rather sacrifice self, and if you have somebody who needs my help, I am willing to minister to them to be a blessing. Be careful what you pray. As soon as I said amen, a big lady sat next to me at the window, 
And trust me, she was big. Basically, she took her chair and the third of my chair, so I had to lean like this. And then, a big lady came on my left at the aisle, and I was in, the, in between, squeezed like a sardine in the can, you know? I said, this is the worst trip of my life. Six hours to Atlanta, I'm going to be numb. Oh, man, I cannot even move. And the big lady in the right at the window started to cry. And she was sobbing. She put her head in her palm. She was crying. I said, can I help you? She says, no, leave me alone. I said, okay, that's easy. And then the lady in the left side says, how can you help her? I said, I don't know. I can pray for her. Oh, you believe in prayer? Yes, me too. And I let her talk because when they talk, they love you more than if you talk. So I let her talk. I said, tell me more about what you believe about prayer. Oh, she started to tell me, and 10 minutes she talked about prayer. I said, wonderful, I believe that too. Okay, what do you think about what I said? <clears throat> then I started to tell her about prayer. And I, instead of telling her theory, I gave her stories of prayer. <clears throat> and the theory in between stories. While I was telling her about prayer, the lady from the window stopped crying, and she was listening. And after I finished, she says, that's beautiful. I guess you can help me. Would you pray for me? I said, absolutely. What do you want me to pray for? And she says, well, when I got on the plane, I got a text message that my husband is divorcing me. He's going to marry a different lady. I said, I now know I could not help you because I am married. <laughs> she started to laugh. I said, I'm glad you laugh. I just cannot stand to see ladies crying, you know. And I said, I'm so sorry that he's leaving you. Let me pray for you. I pray for her. And then she says, it didn't help. I am still in pain. I didn't know what to say. What can you say? What can you do? So I prayed, Lord, you put her next to me. You promised wisdom to those who ask. I'm not asking for myself. Oh, I, I want to go to Loma Linda, give me wisdom. Oh, I want to make money, give me I am asking wisdom to know what to tell this lady. As Nehemiah asked wisdom to know what to tell the king. Tell me what to say to comfort her. And God put in my mind right away. I said, Lord, you promised wisdom to give it to rich hands to those who ask, please give me wisdom. So I said, lady, I'm going to tell you something. Don't get upset with me. Let me finish. Hear me. She said, okay, what do you want to say that you are afraid I get upset? I said, lady, you are better off. What are you talking about? I'm divorced. I'm... I said, just listen. Nobody loves you today and hates you tomorrow. If this guy told you that he's divorcing you for another lady, two, three years ago, he stopped loving you. He stopped talking to you. He stopped communicating. He stopped giving you money. Eventually, he became cold. He stopped coming home every night. And then he started to uh, cheat on you. And you felt it, but you had no proof. And then he started to raise his voice and call you names and scream at you and then beat you. And then your life became a hell. You are in stress, you are in pain, your life was no longer life. You hated to go home, you were afraid to go home. It was a war from morning to night, continual hell. And I said, you lived in so much stress that you many times wished to die. And now he finally got the courage to say, I am divorcing you. But he divorced you long ago. Now it's difficult for you. But if you pray, God is going to give you strength, support you, heal you. Six months down the road, more or less, You'll be over. But when you go home tonight, nobody's going to scream at you. You actually can rest. And I said, six months down the road, when you get better, don't get married because that guy is pretty or that guy has money or that guy tells jokes. Pray that God is going to give you one who loves Jesus because if he loves Jesus, he loves you. She opened big eyes. Are you a prophet? I said, no, I'm only a pastor. How do you know exactly what you said three years ago? That's what happened. I said, well, I prayed because I didn't know what to tell you, that God would give me wisdom, and God impressed me. Are you talking to God? I said, well, yes. He talks to you? Yes. That's unusual. I said, nope. In the Bible, God talks to people, and God doesn't change. He wants to talk to you today. It's just that we are too busy with self to have time to talk to God. Even when we pray, we tell him a lot, and we never listen. And what he tells you is more important than what you tell him. And I said, we just never listen. She says, wow, tell me more. I said, nope, I want to sleep. <laughs> I have a book, this book, read it. Oh, I don't read books. 
I just watched TV. I said, that's a big problem. You need to change it. She said, what? I said, you heard me. Read this book. I don't read books. Read a page. If you don't like it, give it back. Well, I guess I can read a page. Yes, you can read a page. Take it. She was like, oh, you are so strong. You're so straightforward. Why would I go around the bushes? Read the book. She took the book. She read one page. And she read two pages. And she read three. And she started to laugh and then to cry. And then she gave me a hug. And she was reading. And she gave me another hug. I said, enough. My wife hugs me. Don't, don't. And she kept reading. When we got to Atlanta, she finished the book. She says, can I keep it? I said, yes. Why do you want to keep it? It changed my life. I want to give it to our kids. I want to give it to my sister. I said, give it to them and take another one for you. She emailed me a few months later and she says, God put you next to me on that plane. It changed my life. I want you to know I found the church. I am going to church. I am praying and studying every morning. God put you next to me. I could give you stories until tomorrow. From last week, from this week, from story after story after story. What would it be if every single church member would pray that prayer every day? Lord, use me today. Lord, make me a blessing today. Lord, there are so many people in pain in this society. If there is somebody who needs a blessing, would you please open my eyes, inspire me, and help me to forget myself and to serve? Can you imagine that's the best sermon? That's the best evangelism. Can you imagine our churches would be packed and you don't even have to invite them? And you should not do it to bring them to the church. You should do it because you love them. Jesus healed all ten lepers. And Jesus knew that only one would come back. But Jesus didn't do it to maybe they come to church. Jesus did it because he genuinely loved them. If we would have that compassion, honest love for people, deep, profound love to love them as you love your children. Hopefully you love your children. If you would have that compassion for the neighbor, people feel it, people know it. People would love you, trust you, follow you. They would trust you. It's Christ's method alone. He first ate them, feed them, healed them, Listen to them, visit them, warn their friendship and trust. And then he said, follow me. It never goes the other way around. You never bring a stranger to Christ, but only a friend. And this is not difficult. As I told you about the two church members, what is difficult to pray with them? Think about this. I mean, I want you to... to I'm going to give another example. Uh, I don't want to give any names or locations but I was talking to a church member who was very good man an elder who was very good man and very well to do very well to do I don't want to give a lot of explanation, but in the times when you don't have, didn't have a cell phone or GPS, you would go to Walmart and get a map, a Rand Magnelli map. You remember those maps, 879 or whatever was the price? And you would say to your wife, should I take this exit or next exit? Please, please tell me. And she would look in the, you remember? Okay, he made those maps. Okay, so that church member, when I preached, I said, what if everyone in the church the kids, everyone, would go to the neighbor with some cookies, some tomatoes, and say, I want to pray for you. Many times we are more afraid to pray for them than they are afraid to be prayed for. Moreover, in our society, so much pain, so many people suffer. If you have time to listen, people are in pain. And people do, most of them appreciate prayer. You don't need to give them a sermon, just give them a prayer. And the cookie. All you can give them the prayer and give me the cookie. Either way. But, so, literally, he came to me, this rich elder. And he said, Pastor, I do understand that poor people or middle class people need help, need a cookie, need some vegetables, uh, need a prayer. But rich people, millionaires, where I live in our community, 
They are extremely private. They don't open the door. They don't talk to anybody. They don't know each other. We don't know each other's name. We don't, except, good morning, that's it. And they certainly don't come to evangelism if you invite them, or to a Bible study, and or to a church event. Uh, there is no way to reach those people. And you say we should give the good news to everybody. We should serve everybody. It's impossible in my neighborhood, Pastor. I said, my friend, now listen carefully. God doesn't have a harvest problem. God has a worker's problem. My friend, the rich have diabetes as the poor. The rich have depression as the poor. The rich have divorce as the poor. The rich need salvation as the poor. It's just that we don't know how to reach them. We try to use the same medication for all the patients. If they had a headache or they broke the leg, we still give them aspirin. And I said, the problem is not with your neighbors. The problem is with you. He said, what are you talking about, Pastor? You need to pray that God would give you wisdom how you can reach the rich. And you need to pray that God would give you wisdom how to reach the students. Or for every situation, you need a different way. And God has that way. And you think it's impossible because you never talk to God for them. Did you pray for them? He says, yes, I did. And I said, how long? He says, oh, I don't know. I said, then you didn't pray. Oh, yes, I did. How long? I don't know. Then you didn't pray. What do you mean? Well, let me explain. If you fast one minute, you don't know. But if you fast a week from food, trust me, you know. If you pray 15 seconds, you don't know. But when you pray a month, trust me, you know. You follow me? It takes commitment. Not just, oh, no, no, amen. Oh, I pray for my neighbor. Don't tell me that if your son had a car accident and he's an ER, you pray, Lord, heal my son, bye. You labor in prayer. Then shouldn't we labor in prayer for the neighbor? If you really care? What if it was your son or your daughter? So I said, Pray for them with dedication. Set half an hour aside every morning while I have a job. If I come and visit you, would you give me half an hour? Yes. Then give Jesus half an hour. Set half an hour aside every morning. If you say that you care, that's how you show. Sacrifice. And pray labor for them and say, Lord, give me my neighbors or take my life. Because Jesus was willing to do that, to give his life. You follow me? Moses said, take my name off and save them. Paul says, I would rather be anathema, that in Greek means cut off from the book of life, if you would save them. If you are a Christian, you are willing to sacrifice self to do what Jesus did. So I self pray and say, Lord, give me my neighbors. If not, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to pray until you kill me. I'm not going to let you go. Give me my neighbors. He says, whoa, that's a lot of prayer. I said, yep. That means commitment and love. And I said, the more you pray, the more you care, the more you tune your ear with God's voice. So the more God can impress you, talk to you. He may talk to you, but you never hear because you're not used. How, how do you know God's voice? How do you recognize God's voice? How do you recognize God's voice when he talks to you? So you, you make sure that it's not your voice because you ate too much pizza last night. How do you know that it's God's voice? Very simple. Story in the story. I'm going to tell you quick how. My wife and I talk all the time. From morning through night, I don't go to sleep before I talk to her, FaceTime. Wherever I am in the world, after I finish preaching, I call her. When I am driving, we talk. When I get to the hotel, we talk. When I go to sleep, we talk. And she knows that I eat all the time, eight, nine, ten times a day, every four hours. And she, we call each other, hey, I miss you, I miss you too, I love you, I love you too. Did you eat? I didn't have time. Get some sandwich, get something, because otherwise you know, you get dizzy. Eat something. I know, I know, but I am busy. Get a sandwich. I'm going to call you one minute later. Promise me that you stop and get a sandwich. Okay, honey, I'll get a sandwich. Love you, love you, bye. One minute later, Trrr. did you get a sandwich? Yes, love you, love you, bye. Four hours later, hey, how are you doing? Good, you? Good. Did you eat? No, I'm busy. Go get a sandwich. Okay, I'm going to call you back. Okay, love you, love you, bye. You follow me? When I drive home, I get between mountains. I lose signal. She calls. Love you, sandwich. <laughs> How do I know that it's my wife? I know the voice and I know the message. It's always consistent. Do you get what I'm trying to say? You cannot know somebody that you never talk with. If you want to know God's voice, you need to talk a lot with him. And the more you talk with him, the more you know the voice and the more you know the message because God doesn't change. We do. 
You follow me? You want to know his voice? Spend time with him. Spend time in prayer, spend time in the Bible, and you'll learn to distinguish his voice. You follow me? Back to the story. I told my friend, my rich friend, I said, listen, I have only three, four minutes left over. I'll finish this story and that's it. I told my rich friend, pray for them and pray enough that you can tune your ear with God's voice so God could impress you what to do. Pray enough that whatever God tells you to do, regardless how crazy, you'll do it. Because unless you pray to the point that God would change you, you'll never do what he says. What if he told you, like Abraham, leave your country? What if he told you, like, like, like Noah, build an ark? You need to pray enough to know him, to trust him, to do whatever he says. Pray until you are ready. When you are ready, God is going to give you the plan. How long should I pray, pastor? I don't know, two, three, four months? Commit a time, set a time, half an hour a day for three months. And pray for your neighbors. Oh, that's commitment. Yes, that's what I am talking about. Aren't you committed to your job? Yes. Aren't you committed to your family? Yes. Then shouldn't we be committed to God? He said, I got it. He started to pray. Good man. A month later, he called me, Pastor, I've been an Adventist all my life. Missionary kid, you know, his, his father was a missionary. My father has been a pastor and a missionary. My grandfather. I know the doctrines. I know everything. But I have never experienced God so profoundly until now. Since I started to pray the way you say. The more I pray for the neighbors, the more I see God's presence in my family. The more I pray for them, the more I sense the blessing and his presence with my kids. I sense that God is with us. I, I sense when God impresses me, and when I obey, things go perfect. When I don't obey the voice, things... And he says, I actually started to walk with God and talk with God. You know the song, and he walks with me and he talks. We sing it, but we don't live it, you know. And so he said, different life. Another month or two later, he called me, God impressed me what to do for the neighbors. Well, he invited me over. I had a Kia Rio. Not the nice ones that they just came with. That was long ago. We talk about 2003, 2004. It was the first junk tip type of Kia that was like, uh, like Mr. Bean's car that you keep your knees in your mouth and very small. And, anyway, and that car, my wife hit it in the right side. My father-in-law hit it in the left side. My friend from Spain hit it in the back. It was junk, hit and be beaten all over. And the covers from the rotors were bent, touching the rotors. So a new driver would do... When I would get in the morning at the church Saturday morning, the church members knew that I am coming because they heard, ksh, 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 ksh. Oh, the pastor is here, you know. And so I take my Kia Rio to go and visit this church member. And he lives around the lake. It's an exclusive neighborhood, closed with fences and gates. And there is a little, uh, little house and a guard there. I stop at the gate. Would you open the gate? He looks through the window down to my car and he says, you are in the wrong neighborhood. I said, no, I'm in the right neighborhood. I visit so-and-so. Wait a second. He calls my elder. There is a crazy man in a junky Kia Rio. He says that he's your pastor. And he's here to visit you. Yeah, that's my pastor. Let him in. Okay. He opens the gate. I go in. And I'm driving. Ferrari, Maserati, <laughs> Tesla. You follow me? Mercedes, Lexus, Kia Rio. You know? Big homes, six, seven million dollars home around the lake, big, gigantic homes. I'm like, whoa, open mouth like when you go to the dentist, whoa. I get to him and he says, Pastor, and that's when he told me, this is what God impressed me. This is the plan. God, after three months, four months of prayer, God gave me the plan. I know what I do. We ate together. Man, his wife cooked the best food that you can dream of. I mean, she should start a restaurant. I ate until I could not get off the chair. It was like, whoa, this is heaven. This is good. And he said, this is what God impressed me. Every time somebody visits, they say, my wife cooks amazing. These rich people will never go to church, but they will drive far away to a good restaurant. I'm going to invite them to eat together. And I just prayed, last, like, last week he said, and after I prayed, Lord, give me the wisdom. I will not let you go before you tell me how to reach my neighbors. And I read then Christ's method alone. And God impressed me, you need to first build friendship. So I'm going to invite them to eat with me as Jesus ate with the sinners. And he says, I'm going to invite them to eat with me. I said, brother, this is amazing food. When you invite them to eat, invite me too again. <laughs> he smiled. 
I left. He called me back a few months later. And he told me the story. One Sunday morning, he sees his neighbor cleaning the Porsche. He says, good morning. Uh, good morning. Hey, today is my anniversary. My wife and I have 25 years of marriage. Oh, congratulations. My wife cooked food. Come and eat together. Ah, oh, thank you, but I don't have time. And he said, God impressed me to describe the food. And he says, I started telling him, we have stuffed cabbage rolls, and we have this, and we have that, Mediterranean salad with, with kalamata olives and feta cheese, and we have this food, and we have this, and we have baklava. And, we, and he says, as I was describing the food, the guy opened a big mouth. <laughs> and he said, I'm coming. <laughs> when the guy, the neighbor, came, he says, in my house, nobody eats without prayer. Well, I... Uh, I've never prayed in my life. That's okay. Close your eyes. I pray. Okay. And he says, tell me what to pray for. Uh, I, I don't know if I should tell you. My wife and I are separated for quite a few years. And our kids are teenagers. They don't talk to us. They are always on the cell phone and they are ashamed of us. So you want me to pray for your family? Yes. So my elder prayed for, his, for the neighbor's family and then prayed for the food. And then they ate. And the neighbor says, this is amazing. You should open a restaurant. And after they eat, my elder says, let's play a game. And then he says, what? Let's play a game. We are adults. I don't play games. When is the last time when you had fun or played a game? Pfft. When I finished college long ago, we, you and me, are always stressed with business. I have so many people that I am responsible for. If I don't do well, 400 people lose their jobs. He says, I know, me too. When I come home, even at home, I work until 10 p.m., I am on my laptop. We never have time for family, we never have time for our soul, we never have time to rest, we never have, to have time to have fun, to relax, to rejoice, to smile. We ate together, let's play one hour. No, I don't have one hour. Half an hour, he says, God impressed me to give him a long time to have work to negotiate from. Half an hour, nope. 15 minutes, come on. Well, 10 minutes, I could try just because you, we ate together, but I don't. 10 minutes. And they played Monopoly and they played Settlers of Catan. And my elder told me, I can beat anybody. I'm so good. But I didn't beat him. I allowed him to win so he would enjoy the game. He said, whoa, I beat you, let's play again. And then I let him win a second time. He says, I got to go home. But this is the best day I remember in the last 20 years. This is the funniest day. We ate, we played, this is good. And my elder says, let's do it again next Sunday. Let's do it again. We set aside two hours. Next Sunday, we do it again. My elder told me that that neighbor left literally whistling. <laughs> he got home. He opens the door, whistling. His kids look to him. We have never seen you whistling. What's wrong with you? Are you sick? No, I went to the neighbor, we ate Greek food, and he starts to describe the food. And he had this, and the baklava, it was so good. And then we played games, and I beat him. And the kids, Dad, you played games? What's wrong with you? You never play with us? It was the best day. I'm going to go back next Sunday. We are going to eat and play again. Dad, can we come? Let me call him. Can, can the kids come? Yeah, yeah, you can come. He goes upstairs. The wife says, the kids talk to you? Yeah. What did you do to them? Oh, I went to the neighbor. And he describes the food. He says, and we play games? And the wife says, you play games? Yep. And I go back next Sunday, and the kids come. And the wife says, can I come? Yeah. Next Sunday, next Sunday, next Sunday. After a few months, this neighbor goes to play golf with another neighbor. And he says, my family is back together. My wife and I are like never before. When we got married, we are not so close. The kids talk to us again. My family is back together. What counselor did you go? No counselor. Every Sunday we go to that neighbor. We pray together. He prays for my family. We eat Greek food together and the food is heavenly. And then we play games together. We have fun. You play games? It's the best day of the week. I can hardly wait for Sunday. And the neighbor says, can I come one time to see it? Let me call him. Yeah, you can come. Next Sunday, two millionaire families. Two, three months later, four millionaire families. One, two years down the road, 11 families, millionaires, meeting at this church elder. Amen. Eating, praying, playing. About two more years later, I baptized over 40, I don't remember, 45, 46 millionaires. God has 
a plan for you. And God has a method. And when you are willing to obey him, he's going to give you the idea, the resources, the victory, the blessings. But it isn't it sad that we call ourselves Christians and so many times we don't even seek God's plan because we are too busy with our plans. What if our time is up? I, went, I was supposed to finish at 8.24 and it's 8.32. I told you last night, I confess, but I don't repent. <laughs> what if every church member, regardless age, would start praying for a neighbor? Lord, you know Mary or whatever, or Jimmy, or would you please help me to reach them? Would you make me like Jesus? Would you make me a light? Would you make me a blessing? Lord, you may have somebody that I don't know that is in pain today. Would you use me today. Would you make me a blessing today? I could give you story after story. One time at work with my secretary, I prayed that prayer and God impressed me. And when I went there, she was almost dying. I got there in the last moment. When, when you ask God to make you a blessing, you will be impressed of the stories you have to tell. You don't have a story from 40 years ago when you got baptized. You have a story from yesterday. What if everybody would become a light, salt, a blessing to the world. The church would be different. People don't need so much our theory. People need love. It's a lot easier to give them a doctrine, a lesson, but the real character is shown the way we live, not the way we preach. I'm not saying that we should not preach. I'm not saying that the doctrines are not good. They are biblical, they are good. They are from the Bible. I'm not saying that we should not teach. But our teaching has no power unless we live what we teach first. That's the reason many times we have no power to convict anybody. But if the church would live that way, people would not need to be convinced. When people see Christ love in you, instantly people come. So let me finish with a prayer because our time is up. Um, if I go this way, I will never get invited again. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I really pray that we are not only listeners but doers. I really hope and pray that as you go home, you make a decision tonight and you say, Lord, make me a blessing. You are responsible for your neighbors, for your friends. Lord, use me. And you don't pray one time because you need to pray enough so God could prepare you for what he has in plan. But the more you pray that prayer, the more you will experience God's presence and leading in your life. God has a plan for each one every day. People call me, oh, I prayed and God didn't talk. God doesn't talk the way we talk because we like to hear our own voice. We talk nonsense, we just like talking. God talks when there is a need. And you need to keep listening so when he talks, you hear it. You follow me? You need to always be listening. You always need to be connected. You always need to be ready for service. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what an amazing call to live like Jesus, to be a blessing, to know that people not only that they may be helped and blessed, but they could be in heaven for eternity through us, that you are willing to work through us to save others, to work with the angels, to work together with Jesus for the salvation of precious souls that you died, you gave your son for. Lord, please put, us that, put in us that, that compassion, that love, that we care for one another. We, as Jesus said, when you love one another, then people will know that we love people the way we love self. Father, please help everybody who heard this message to pray this prayer every day to the point that people will see Jesus in us. We pray in Jesus' name and thank you. Amen. In this quiet place
with you, I bow before your throne. I bear the deepest part of me to you and you alone. I keep no secrets, for there is no thought you have not known. I bring my best and all the rest to you. Father in heaven, as we go home, we pray that your Holy Spirit will work with us, in us, through us, that we may reflect Jesus. Please be with us this Sabbath. Pour your Spirit over everyone here, those who listen on the internet, wherever they are, now or later. Pour your Spirit over us, that we may experience your presence, be transformed, become more like Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name and thank you, Lord. Amen.